Hello everybody, I'm Gwen Campbell Mendes and welcome to Gwen's Bookish Ramblings. And today we are returning, as we do every other week, to the Cat Who book series. Um, so we'll let the cat stare into your soul for a moment longer because, you know, cat. Um, so I said in the last video on Cat Who that, um, that was the book where everything changes. Um, and it is the book where everything changes in that we get our introductions to the cast of Pickaxe. That is, all of those people in Moose County, Pickaxe City, what, however you want to uh, think of it, those are the people who are going to be the regulars and semi-regulars for the rest of the series. Um, and what that book does is it also introduces this new format, because Quillerin from now on, is not employed with the Daily Fluxion, he's not employed by the newspaper, he is an incredibly rich man who is just doing stuff that he's interested in doing. Um, the thing is that that last book, it starts it starts off uh, giving us that theme, but this next book is the one where we really, really get that shift. Now, it's true that book after book after book does meet some of the same uh, systematic um, uh, plot points as, as all the others. You have Quillerin, you have his cats, Coco decides to push books off of shelves, or, you know yowl in the middle of the night at particular times, and Quillerin uses these as clues to help him figure out whatever crime is uh, being committed. But the, uh, the difference here is that he's not on assignment, and after this point, we don't have a brand new cast of characters in this. What we have is we have the same cast of characters with one or two new additions. Um, now, there are some differences, there are a couple of, uh, other books in the series where we get the new cast of characters, which I assume, uh, Lillian Braun was doing for a bit of variety, but as of now, Quillerin is living in a small town where everybody knows everyone else, everybody has grown up with everyone else, and it's palpably different from the other books because you don't read you read the other books to see who the new colorful cast of characters is going to be. From now on, you want to see your old favorites. You want to see Nick and Lori Bamba. You want to see Junior. You want to... Junior Goodwinter. Um, I don't really remember his proper name, actually. Um, you don't... You, what you want to see is you want to see all of these people and places that have become familiar in the new book. So, what happens is, the cat who played post office is one of the first two books, because this book and the next one, which we will get to week after, um, a week after next, is, these next two books are the ones that set up what Quillerin is going to be doing. The cat who played post office, the biggest thing here is, the cover of the book, which is actually my copy, and as you can see, it's a used copy, because I pick up a lot of books used, but it's one of my favorites, so at least a few of those wrinkles on the cover are my fault. And what happens in this book is Quillerin with a lot of money is like that apocryphal dog who is trying to catch a car. That is, the the old saw that a dog is trying to catch a car, but he doesn't know what he'll do with it when he gets it. Quillerin with a lot of money is a lot like that. He's got all this money, which means that he can now feed the cats in the manner to which they have become accustomed and not have to worry it will break the bank. It means that he can afford to buy himself all of the new Macintosh tartan ties that he wants. All of these things. But... He doesn't really know what to do with it because his entire life, he grew up with a single mother, and um, based on these books, we have learned that he must have fought in World War II. 
He is 14, he's in his mid to late 40s now, and he was in his 20s when he was in a war that blew out his knee, so it must have been the Second World War. Um, and so you're talking about a guy who was, who lived through the Depression, who grew up during the Depression, and so he, with a single mother, and, and so this is a guy who really, he's always not had a lot of money. And we know from the first three books that he had had not a lot of money through that. And so when he's got a lot of money, he's left thinking, what do I do with this? Because he really, really doesn't know. And so one of the themes of this book, and it's not a huge one, but it is a kind of a significant one because it informs the kind of rich guy that he is over the rest of the series. Um, it, but one of those minor themes is, I've got a lot of money now, I don't know what to do with it, because he's not one of those people who, who always wanted a huge house. He didn't. And anyways, he's just inherited a huge house, so if he wants a huge house, he's already got one because he just inherited it from Aunt Fanny. Um... And, you know, and, and so, as we go through this book with him trying to figure out what he wants to do with himself and with this money, and he settles on something that becomes part of the series, which is the Klingenschoen Fund, which comes to be known as the K-Fund, because uh, Fanny, his Aunt Fanny, had promised a large number of people in Moose County uh, to give them money in her will, and when she didn't give them money in her will and left it to him, it left a lot of people very upset. So in The Cat Who Played Post Office, one of the things he proposes is, you give me whatever I need to live off of, and the rest of this goes to the K Fund, that we will create a, a, you know, charitable organization, and people can just ask for grants from it, and all that money will go right back into the community. And it sets up, it sets up a lot of who he's going to be as, as a rich person. The other thing, though, is this book starts with one of those, uh, one of those opens that is not necessarily the bit that gets used overused a lot in television and that is those cold opens of dun 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 our heroes are dangling off a cliff 24 hours before and those if not handled correctly are honestly a little bit exasperating because a lot of us really would rather if you just started 24 hours before because the cold open hasn't really done anything except leave you exasperated that we're now having to go back 24 hours before just to watch it slot into place. Um, this one, however, it starts with Quilleran having amnesia. And one of the interesting things about this is it's really, really good. The Cat Who Played Post Office is, interestingly, very, very good as a starting point for the series if you want to introduce somebody to the series, which the bulk of which actually is going to take place after The Cat Who Played Post Office. There are some 20-odd books in this series, and only the first four take place in the big city with him working at the Daily Fluxion. The rest of them take place in Pickaxe. And if you want somebody to start off this series with the full awareness that the bulk of this is going to be the Pickaxe stuff, this is a great book because in this first chapter, we are introduced to Quillerin's then-girlfriend, Melinda Goodwinter, and they have to explain everything to him, and Arch Riker, his old best friend, who does become a regular in the Pickaxe series, uh, Pickaxe part of this series, shows up and tells us Quillerin's life story, in short in order to spark Quillerin's memory, and Quillerin remembers everything, and, uh, but it, it's a really, really good book 
if you what you want to do is you want to get somebody started and you don't want them to start with the first couple books because those aren't like the rest of the series in certain key ways. Um, and there, there is a value to that. Um, so the mystery in uh, The Cat Who Played Post Office has to do with a young woman who used to be the maid at the Klingon show and mansion that Quilleran is supposed to live in at or around for five years in order for the money to be inherited by him properly. Um, and she went missing and everybody thought she ran off and it turns out that she was murdered by the sister of the guy who had gotten her pregnant. And there's this whole thing throughout the book where Quillerin is flirting with and, and just enjoying the company of, although not dating, because he is dating uh, the doctor, Melinda Goodwinter. Um, but he's he has these constant interactions with Penelope, Penelope Goodwinter, who is the lawyer, one of the two lawyers, her and her brother Alexander, are the lawyers who were working for uh, and with the uh, um, Fanny Klingenshaw and and, and and everything that she was inheriting, and it turns out that they're really horrible people, and it's fascinating because when you get to the end of this book, you realize exactly how deeply, deeply. Um, off kilter and unwell Penelope Goodwinter must have been because she was disturbingly obsessed with her brother in childhood, gave up her dreams of being a writer in order to become a lawyer to be the brains behind her brother because, of course, law of primogeniture and the son must take over the family business and if he can't hack it, if he can't hack it, then his sister has to prop him up. But that doesn't matter because she is unhealthily obsessed with him. And then when he has, and then when he winds up having a relationship with with Daisy Mull, she uh, tries to arrange for Daisy Mull to leave. And then when Daisy tries to start a paternity suit, she, in effect, arranges for Daisy's murder. Now, it's a little bit accidental because the guy she had asked to do to do this, she had really just wanted him to convince Daisy to leave. But nonetheless, that guy murders Daisy and then blackmails her and her brother for the next, like, five, six years. And it's an incredibly disturbing story. Now, I, I continue to maintain that Cat Who Saw Red is is more disturbing because, again, I felt like the the death there was much more calculated, whereas in this one, um, in this one, Penelope Goodwinter is just doing what she believes is defending her brother, even though that's really, really disturbing what she's doing. Um, but... And but the and the thing is, Birch Trevelyan, who is the guy who murdered, uh, who wound up murdering Daisy and dropping her into the bottom of a of a mine shaft. He's he's uh, you know it's it's a horrifying idea killing a young girl for pay, but it's not calculated. It doesn't it doesn't have that same sense of calculation. And it doesn't have that same sense of of calculation in relation to a person that he knows. You know, this this isn't a that this isn't a person who he's super close friends with. This isn't a person who is his you know his wife or anything else. She's just somebody that he knows because they're both from Moose County and everybody knows the moles. Um. And so, this this is such a, an an interesting introduction because it manages to combine that that small town feel that that everybody knows everyone with the mystery of because everyone knows everyone. No one expects anyone 
to do these horrible things. And that's one of the most important things that informs the rest of this series. And see you next week.